uh, bright and early Monday morning event at ITIF. Uh, I'm Rob Atkinson, president of ITIF, and uh, have a very interesting event this morning to talk uh, about uh, a little bit about UK versus US innovation policy, but mostly with the focus on the former UK innovation policy. So I'll start off making just a few. Uh, we, start off making just a few opening remarks about you know, where we, U.S. innovation policy is. Uh, Lord Jones will talk more substantially about what's going on in the U.K. Uh, and, and really to, to understand what's going on in the U.K., I think you have to sort of have a presentation every week because there's so many new things that the government there is doing uh, that, are, that are very important and interesting to learn about. Um, so let me introduce uh, our, our speakers and then um, I'll make some remarks. I'll start with uh, Lord Jones, who's the UK business ambassador. Uh, Digby Lord Jones of Birmingham served as the Minister for Trade and Investment for the Department of Business, Enterprise, and Regulatory Reform, uh, and the Foreign and Commer Commonwealth Office from 2007 to 2009. Uh, he also served as Director General of the Confederation of Business, British Industry, CBI, uh, which was a, sort of like our business roundtable, only, only bigger. Uh, and from 2000 to 2006. He was also a private advisor to uh, uh, His Royal Highness the Duke of York and was the UK government skills envoy. So uh, and before that, he joined KPMG as vice chairman of corporate finance. So we're very pleased to welcome uh, Lord Jones. Um, Cynthia Bouthot, Bouthot is the president of the Collaborative Innovation Group, a company focused on providing organizations, governments, and economic development agencies, tools, methodologies, and products uh, to develop routes to market. She's also head of the uh, UK's uh, Trade and Investment Innovation and in R&D programs, where she's working across the US to leverage innovation hubs more effectively, and has a long uh, background in uh, both in, in government, uh, British government, and in industry. And finally, uh, uh, Taffy Kingscott is Director of Global Partnerships, Strategic, Research, Strategic Partnerships for IBM Research, uh, most of you know Taffy. She's um, really been a leader in the innovation policy space in government. Uh, she took a little leave a while back and went to the uh, uh, Industrial College of the Armed Forces in the National Defense University, where she taught there. Uh, and uh, before that, would have been with IBM. And I'm not going to say how many years you've been there because you don't really know about that all. Been at IBM a long time. So. All right, well, let me start by just sort of making a few comments about where I think U.S. innovation policy is. Uh, I think the overarching term to describe where we are is that we have a de facto unplanned innovation policy. Uh, we certainly uh, have sort of an explicit science policy, if you will. We focus on uh, agencies like NSF, uh, DOE, Office of Energy, NIST, um, NIH. Uh, but largely the focus on these agencies is about the, the agencies, it's about the mission. So when we doubled NIH, for example, uh, over the last decade, the goal there was really to uh, promote public health uh, and, and to address diseases. It wasn't explicitly to spur the biomedical industry, which has been one of the results of that. Um, and so a lot of what we do is in this is in this sort of what you would call factor conditions area. It's about trying to get more input into this research process, pour it into the sieve at the, at the here, and hopefully something comes out at the end. Uh, but we also have this other package of innovation policies, uh, which many of them really stem from the 80s and the early 90s when we were facing the Japanese challenge. And these would be everything from the Stevenson-Weidler Act, which uh, fostered federal lab tech transfer, uh, SBIR, uh, to uh, spur uh, small business access to uh, federal research money, uh, by Dole, which was to uh, enable, uh, better enable university uh, licensing and patenting, uh, and then TIP, uh, Technology uh, Innovation Program at NIST and MEP, kind of the only really two programs we have specifically focused on commercialization around an industrial mission in the government. And then a few programs in NSF, like the Engineering Research Center program and the IURC program. Again, policies that have their legacy in the 1980s. Um, also, one could put the R&D tax credit in that category. So if you've been in Washington since the 80s, you'll, you'll remember that in the 80s there was this sort of ferment, this real focus on being creative about innovation policy. 
uh, because we had we saw that there was this direct challenge to the U.S. competitive position, and so we did a lot. Uh, passed the Omnibus Trade and Competitiveness Act in '89. Uh, President Reagan had his Council on Competitiveness. Uh, President Bush supported a number of issues, but really, sort of starting with Clinton, uh, when the competitiveness issue really sort of receded, and, and we felt we were we were on top, everything was going great, and then most recently with President Bush, who uh, partly was distracted by other issues and partly had an ideological predisposition to not have an activist innovation policy. We really haven't done very much for 16 years. Uh, and now it's only recently now, I would argue, with the election of uh, President Obama that innovation policy is back at a more central place. Uh, we passed the American Peace Act, um, was that three years ago, I guess, wasn't it? which is now up for reauthorization, which had a number of initiatives in there. Most of them didn't get funded until stimulus, uh, but that was certainly helpful. Um, President Obama's created a CTO position, which has been helpful to kind of raise the level and the visibility of innovation policy in the federal government. Uh, OSTP issued a white paper this summer on innovation policy, which laid out a number of new ideas. And finally, we had the stimulus package, which uh, included a number of uh, initiatives around innovation, uh, certainly funding um, university research and research equipment, uh, health IT, green, uh, smart grid, green energy, and the things like that, and items like that. But having said all that, let me just close by saying, I think given that, we still have a number of big challenges in the U.S. with regard to innovation policy. The first being that we have no innovation policy. We have no strategy. Uh, the, pl the place in the government has the best strategy right now, and probably the best process in 25 years, is, broad is the broadband strategy. If you think about what we're doing there, we're spending millions of dollars bringing in incredibly bright people with a wide variety of backgrounds to systematically go in depth into a whole set of issues on broadband and come up with a strategy. Now, whether we'll actually fund that strategy is a separate issue. But you can't sort of do something right until you figure out the strategy. We don't really do that in innovation policy. And I would argue it's high time we do. Many other countries do. Uh, I think the UK has made many very good efforts in that direction. The second thing we don't do is we don't have any organization explicitly focused on commercial innovation. Uh, we issued a report last year with Brookings um, arguing for a national innovation foundation. But again, you look at other countries, the UK included, who has a, the technology strategies board, they have a, uh, a, a skills board, um, they have a number of organizations that are specifically focused on this. They have a group called NESTA, which is the National Endowment of Science, Technology, and the Arts, yes. which is focusing on sort of entrepreneurial creativity. We don't do that. Uh, we don't have an innovation policy review process in the federal government. There is no place in the federal government where new rules, regulations, and other types of uh, procedures get reviewed from an innovation lens. And finally, uh, we're largely uh, underfunding our system here in the U.S. We're one of the only countries in the uh, OECD where uh, there was a decline in federal R&D as a share of GDP over the last 15 years. Um, we simply haven't put the money in it that most other countries have done. Um, why is all that? Let me just close by saying two points. Two things that we don't have that the UK has, that Singapore has, that China has, that many other countries have, a lack of urgency. Uh, you go to the UK and they focus on this on a pretty regular basis because they realize that they're a small country in a big world and that if they don't do this, that they're not going to be able to be, have the benefits of an innovation-based economy. I think the U.S. still has a uh, viewpoint that we're number one. Uh, we released a report earlier this year called the Atlantic Century, which showed that we're not number one, we're actually number six on innovation-based measures around the world. And more troubling, we're number 40, out of 40, by the way, uh, 40 out of 40 on progress on innovation metrics over the last uh, decade. And the last problem we have that, uh, that I, I sometimes wish I, I, I should move to other countries and get a job there because uh, uh, we don't, these other countries really don't have this big heavy meta physical debate about should government be involved or the private sector. The answer is yes. You know, the UK, they realize that the private sector is going to take the lead, but that government has to play a key role. Uh, most other countries have come to that consensus. We haven't. We're debating between should it be government dominated or private sector dominated. I think a very 
uh, uh, sort of fruitless debate that really we need to move beyond. And once we do that, I think then we'll be in a much better position to do the kinds of policy innovations that a country like the UK has done. So with that as a setup, um, Lord Jern, you're going to tell us exactly how the UK is doing all these wonderful things. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. I, th I have to say, I, uh, I thought that's certainly putting up the ball for me to hit it in the net, really. Isn't it? <laughs> that's very, very kind of you. Well, good morning to you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Lord Digby Jones, I'm a native of Birmingham in the middle of England, and I was born to uh, parents who gave me love and enthusiasm and no money. <laughs> and, uh, and I think I got the better of the deal, basically. Uh, and uh, uh, the whole of the street in which I was born worked at the Austin Motor Company, made by the cars. And it would, uh, everybody in the family did, and that was my upbringing, was in good old fashioned metal bashing. Uh, then got a scholarship to read law at uh, University College London and uh, was a corporate lawyer for 20 years before headhunters came calling to take me into the public realm and into public policy with firstly the Confederation British Industry and uh, as you said later the, uh, the government. When, uh, when I got a call from the then two day old Prime Minister, well, well Gordon Brown wasn't two days old. <laughs> Some of his colleagues were, but no, he was. Uh, <laughs> I've given up telling political jokes actually because they tend to get elected. Um, I, uh, the, the, uh, when I got the call, uh, he said, Come in and give us a couple of years uh, to bring some knowledge and experience into the business policy implementation uh, of the government. Uh, and he did it in health with uh, Professor Ara Darzi, he did it in Homeland Security with the, the head of the Navy. A guy called Alan West, and he did it with um, foreign policy with Mark Millett Brown, who'd been here in New York at the United Nations. And the whole idea, they, it's called the government of all the talents, and what it was about was trying to get not at cabinet level, not at policy formulation level, but at the implementation of policy level, people who actually with respect knew what they were talking about in a specific sector. And the idea was that we went out after a couple of years back to the private sector, and we all have. Alan is still there, actually, but we, we've all um, come in and done it, and we've been replaced by others who've come in. Outside my successor is uh, Mervyn Davis, who was uh, chief exec and then chairman of Standard Charter Bank. He's come in for two years to do the same thing. It's an absolute departure for UK of any party. Uh, I applaud it. Um, the Americans and the French and the, the Japanese have done it for years, and we never have. And uh, I, I think if only whoever comes into power next year at our general election, whichever side, I just hope they carry it on. Uh, I, I did say to him at the time, well, there'll be two conditions, Gordon. I said, one is I won't join the party. He said, oh, the Labour Party won't like that. I said, they'll get used to it. And they didn't. And, um, and I said, because I believe the wealth creation aspect of our country should transcend the factionalism of party politics. It should move on. You can have the party political debate about what you do with the money educational, healthcare, military, or roads, it doesn't matter, you can have that route, but in creating wealth, this should be above and beyond uh, party politics. And uh, bless him, he let me do it on that basis. And I'm still the only minister of any government the country has ever had that didn't belong to the party of government. And I said, the second thing is I shall go in two years' time. And it was Harry Truman, uh, when he, in his inauguration address, taking over from FDR, just before the end of the Second World War, he said, it is remarkable what you can achieve when you don't care who gets the credit. And uh, I wanted people to understand I was doing the job for the country and for my values of business and wealth creation, not uh, to join the political greasy pole of advancement and ambition. And uh, it worked. I visited 45. I made 45 ministerial visits overseas in 50 years. My wife thought I'd left her, I just hadn't told her. <laughs> and, uh, it, uh, and I left uh, a year ago back into the private sector. But uh, about every two or three months, I do four or five days uh, in an overseas market for uh, the UK Trade and Investment, which is the uh, trade promotion, investment promotion arm of Her Majesty's Government. And um, I do it very happily. There are about uh, 20 of us who in one way or another, in different sectors, different fields, do this sort of thing. And it's uh, a new dimension for the nation. It seems to be working. The, uh, this couldn't be held at a more important time for both your country and mine, because the paradigm has shifted forever. And the 21st century belongs to Asia. 
the 19th century belonged to my country, and the 20th century belonged to your country, the 21st century belongs to Asia. And how America, at the top of the pile, deals with the fact that she isn't coming off the top. She's nearly going to have quite a bit of company at the top. How she deals with that and how other countries deal with that is going to define the 21st century. It's going to map out everything from peace to employment, from how we deal with climate change right the way through to how we deal with communication. It, it, is, it is a century of understanding the world has changed and implementing it accordingly. And let me just uh, give that background a little bit of thought when we look at one country in particular. 1.3 billion people. The most populous nation on earth, and that is China. Now, if you'll bear with me one minute and give it some scale, let us assume that over here you have the eastern seaboard of China. So you've got um, uh, Shanghai about here, you've got Beijing about here. Down there you've got the Pearl River Delta, the Shenzhen, Guangdong, and Hong Kong. In there, which is the eastern seaboard, Beijing downwards, You've got about 300 million people. That is the population of your country. And they're in there. And they're going absolute gangbusters. I mean, they're, 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 they're doing everything. It's the, it's, it's the China we all are told about. And, uh, from here to here, <laughs> you've got another billion people. That is more than the population of the United States of America, 300 million. The population of the entire 27 countries of the European Union, 520 million. The population of Japan, Australia, and Canada, all put together, are all in the space from Beijing westwards. And 800 million of that billion are on under $2 a day. So the populations of America and the European Union put together pull down $2 a day. Minimum wage in the United Kingdom, £6 an hour. $9 an hour. And 800 million people are getting $2 a day. <coughs> Somewhere down here, in southwest China, you've got a farmer right now, this Monday morning. But he's got his pig and his cow, he's got a little bit of rice on the paddy field, he doesn't know how he's going to feed his kids this winter. And the deal... Beijing say, we will make you richer. In return, you'll let us run the country, but we will make you richer. That $2 will turn into $3 and $4 and $10 and $20 over the next two generations. And the only way that they can make this work is to move that wealth line that way as quickly as possible. That has got to get that way, because that's the unspoken pact of the people. I'll make you richer. In return, you let us run the country. Now, as they move the wealth line this way, <coughs> they create a vacuum here. Because in there is the stuff that they've taken from you and us, Japan, Germany, France. They put it in there. They've commoditized innovation. And as they move that stuff this way, in that vacuum, they put the next lot of stuff that we've all done. And about every five years or so, they actually will take our innovation, the ability to take an idea and make money out of it. That's what innovation is. You, how to market, go to market with your ideas. It might be how you check in at a hotel. It might be how you run a hospital. It might be how you procure in defense. It might be how you generate a new drug. It might be how you create a new aircraft engine. It might be how you deal with pollution. The ability to take your ideas and make money out of them. And the one thing that does is it utilizes the one thing you can't put money on. This. Knowledge. But about every five years or so, that country is going to put a price on it. It's going to actually commoditize it. And smack it in there because that wealth line's coming this way. This wasn't new. The United States did it to Europe between the end of the Civil War, 1865, and the First World War, 1914. That's exactly what happened. And if you remember, and if that's the Prime Minister, tell him I'm busy. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, as that, and as that wealth line went this way, the United States 
in the late 19th century, the wealth line went this way as well. America went west, well, John Wayne went west. <laughs> they went that way. It's not new. The difference is, of course, at the time, the population of America was, what, 10 million? It's not new after the Second World War. Japan did it to America. What was the population of Japan at the end of the Second World War? 40, 50 million? It wasn't new that South Korea did it to Japan in the 1980s. Population of Korea at the time, 30 million? That's a billion. This is going to go on for the entire century. And that, my friends, is the challenge. How do developed democratic capitalistic countries deal with that? And just as an aside, in case you think this is China centric, the most populous democracy on earth, India, 1 billion people. 750 million of them still work on the land. For three quarters of the population of the second most populous nation on earth, they have yet to industrialize. And they, in one way, represent a bigger threat. Because they are a democracy. They put their women as equal people. They are religiously tolerant. They have a lot of those values that export really well. Values that India, uh, that, that America and, and Britain and Germany and whatever, we value. They travel well. They invest well, they trade well. So in one way, if they start to industrialize and innovate their nation, that is in a way a bigger threat actually than China. So there, that is the tapestry, the framework against which the innovative drive of our two countries is trying to operate. And I'm very proud of being, and Rob said it, and I'm grateful to you, sir, that <coughs> As a nation, we have actually got on the front foot on this. We've restructured so many of our business sectors. And I say that as a, as a guy who actually came from the Rust Belt in a big way back in, back in Britain. I actually had, uh, when I was a young lawyer, I had an Austin Allegro. This actually, actually had a square steering wheel. That tells you how dreadful it was. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember turning, this was in the sort of 70s, I remember turning the heater lever to feet and all this water dropped out. <laughs> I took it to the dealer and I said, uh, this, this heater's leaking. He said, well, it's been raining, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I remember taking it to uh, Wolverhampton Magistrates Court one day. I was appearing for a client. And I parked it like we always used to park Austin Allegro, you know, window down, keys in. <laughs> Came back and there was a note, if you think I'd steal this, you must be joking. <laughs> We export more motor cars out of the United Kingdom than any other country in Europe except for Germany and Slovakia. You will not read this in the newspaper because it's good news. <laughs> Why would you? And yet we actually are a huge car exporter. And that is because we allow in the innovative drive, mainly of the Japanese manufacturing model, but certainly the Germans as well, and happily the Americans and now the Indians. And we've always said, you know, come in, teach us how to do it, use British labour, pay British corporation tax, and you're very, very welcome. And we've learned from that. And that of its own is an innovative driver, which I'm very, very proud of. And I say that as a kid who came straight out of, if you like, the General Motors Chrysler Ford area of automotive, as opposed to the Toyota Nissan Honda area of automotive, and yet, and yet uh, so successful. So what are we doing? I mean, we understand as a nation that it has to happen. We understand the framework and the background as to why it is vital. But it's no good doing that if government doesn't actually drive forward and produce some very important uh, and very effective initiatives. And I'd just like to take you through one or two things that we do do. The proportion of innovation active businesses, we've, we've taken that from 49% to 68% over six years. So we've added an additional uh, half. It's gone up by 50% in uh, six years. So those businesses that actually have got some aspect of innovation inside what they do. Um, we're not so good on business, business expenditure in R&D. Um, the, the government actually is putting quite a lot of, uh, of, of its tax revenue into it. But from a business private sector investment, we're only fifth in the G7. It's, it's going in the right direction, but uh, it could actually be better. But we've got the second largest equity market in the world after the States. And in that aspect, um, we have a great deal of equity investment um, coming in.
to on the venture capital, private equity, smaller business side of life. We produced what we call white papers. You, I don't know what we call them here. You probably call them bills. They're, they're what happens before you actually get a bill going to Parliament. They're more of a think document out of which comes the statute eventually. Um, and in, uh, a, a couple of years ago, one of my colleagues in government, then John Denham, he produced that. And there are three or four uh, specifics that came out of that. The Office of Life Sciences, that's dedicated to improving the operating environment <coughs> for pharmaceutical, medical biotech, and medical devices sectors. That is specifically there to help that sector. Uh, we call it a new industrial activism, and the National Health Service, I know at the moment, Healthcare is huge on the domestic agenda in America. Uh, the NHS, we are using that as a delivery mechanism for innovation. It's in the heart and the DNA of the people, the NHS in Britain, and, and so actually to use that as one method of getting this message through right down into the grassroots while we all have to skill up is very, very important. And we've been extremely successful in international marketing, the uh, life science sector around the world. We have the second biggest pharmaceutical company on earth, GlaxoSmithKline, biggest in Europe by a mile. We have the fifth biggest, AstraZeneca, and Pfizer, the biggest in the world, Eli Lilly, Johnson & Johnson, all based their European manufacturing headquarters in the United Kingdom, uh, a fact of which we're very, very proud. We have the UK Innovation Fund that you referred to. It's a fund of funds that invests in technology-based businesses that <coughs> have high growth potential. A little bit of a worry there, which is politicians make lousy winner pickers. <coughs> they always do, in every country. And it's very difficult, actually, to say, well, here's some tax dollars, and we poke that one, not that one. And uh, the French always say they do it very well. Actually, they do it very badly, but they do it. And of course, the winners, and there will always be some, tend to clap crowd out a lot of losers. Um, it's something that the Americans and the Brits don't do. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm very convinced in my indecision about this. Because I can't see the benefits of it at times. But the Innovation Fund invests £150 million pounds in order to lever up, with private sector investment, a fund that's a billion. So they're putting in uh, about 11.5% towards getting the largest technology fund in Europe, which it is. My successor at uh, the Confederation of British Industry, CBI, when I left as Director General, was Richard Lambert. He was on the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England. He was the editor of the Financial Times. And uh, he came in to take over my job. He's done a marvellous job uh, uh, running the CBI after me. And uh, one of his uh, uh, nighttime jobs is he produced a fabulous report on getting universities to collaborate with business so much more than they do. Uh, as you know, I think you probably uh, know that in the top 20 universities in the world, there are only two countries mentioned, and that is yours and mine. What you won't like to hear is in the top six, we've now got four and you've only got two. Uh, you have number one, which is Harvard, uh, you've got number four, which is Yale. But Cambridge, Oxford, Imperial College London, and University College London are the other four. But if you think about that from a thought leadership, global eye edition, only two countries who have universities in the top 20 of America and Britain. Now, if we start that far ahead of the game, my friend, we really, really ought to be uh, leading this through the 21st century. But Richard uh, produced a toolkit for collaborative research to get businesses and universities working more closely together. And uh, that uh, has five model research collaboration agreements. And that's one on one. Is that getting a business? in with a university on a specific piece of research turning into innovation, I hope turning into markets, and then four consortia agreements. These where you get a group of businesses coming together, linking with one university on, again, the implementation of a specific piece of research. Their government hasn't produced money. What government's done is produce capacity, facilitation, putting the clout of government behind it, getting it to work. Thirdly, we... Uh, have brought a lot of innovation of to government into innovation procurement. Our public sector as a whole spends £175 billion pounds sterling a year on goods and services. And going forward, each individual government department has to now, by law, produce an innovation procurement plan. 
I know my nation isn't alone. I know you share this with me. You've seen so much waste in the way that government procures. And we see it a lot with companies that buy off the, uh, that sell to the American government. We see it a lot when we sell to our own. And the procurement process could just be so much better. And it's a huge call for innovative ways of going to the procurement market. And then increasing the procurement of products and services that are innovative. So you use the clout of spending taxpayers' money actually to drive an innovation agenda in the companies that are supplying. Don't just buy the stuff that you know works well and always has. Go for the stimulus for trying to do whatever it is more productively. Then we have the Small Business Research Initiative, the SBRI. That's designed to help early stage, high technology SMEs gain greater access to R&D opportunities. You hear it all the time, don't you, in small businesses? Ah, oh, I can't afford it. What's more, it's not worth it. And if I do it, someone's going to steal the idea. I'm just going to carry on doing what I do. And therein lie the seeds of relative decline. It's not that you go backwards, it's that everybody else goes forward more quickly than you. And so effectively, <coughs> in relative terms, decline. To get small business onto the page of R&D opportunities is a huge challenge for governments in both our countries. And this research initiative actually drives an impetus for a smaller business to receive a contract for the full cost of demonstrating the feasibility of their technology. That leads to prototype development. That provides the room for market. That again is capacity building. That again is holding their hand. Creating an environment in which they feel more safe and secure with a lot of help actually to start down the path of further investment, more employment, and trying to compete in an innovative world. And then lastly, we have the one of which we're rather proud. I, I, I'm going to mention this one with due humility and, uh, and uh, serious admiration for what you do. But we do have a National Space Centre. Uh, obviously, it is nowhere near, uh, anywhere near what you guys do. But it's something of which we're very proud. It, of course, is emblematic because off the back of it comes a huge amount of innovation and research, which actually has not a lot to do with sticking a rocket in the uh, sky, but has a lot to do with what's on that rocket when it goes up into the sky. And uh, we uh, monitor the effects of climate change. I think Europe at the moment can hold its head up actually and say that we're probably number one in the world at driving forward uh, measures uh, to deal with climate change. Uh, I sat in Boston when I was a minister at the back end of the Bush administration, and I said, well, the one thing that worries me is when this nation, America, gets it, because it'll be the one country on earth that's got the three things you need, the money, the power, and the need. And I said, you've got the money, you've got the power, you don't understand that you've got a need. And once you either have a president or an administration or a group of people who are set free to feel that way, that the true, genuine solution to man's involvement in climate change, and there's many reasons why climate change is a natural phenomenon, for sure. But frankly, the pollution we're creating can't help it. That, that has to be a given the length and the, and the discussion that we had on the size of that effect. But nevertheless, you know, if you want your kids to grow up in a cleaner world, forget a colder or warmer world, uh, then I believe you can regulate all you like, you can fine and punish all you like. The true, genuine solution from Wuhan in China to Wisconsin and from Birmingham to Barcelona, is technology. Technological solutions are the answer to this, and the nation that can do it more and better than anybody else is the United States of America. Because you've got the power, you've got the cloud, and if you see the need, uh, then the technological solutions will come. And we in Europe, uh, we're on the page, we get it, we understand it, we put a lot of our money and resource into it, and we at the National Space Centre, they uh, deal a great deal, a great deal of work from monitoring and uh, dealing with climate change. Obviously, uh, satellite navigation, telecom services, and high-value R&D in manufacturing all comes out of our space center. If we are going to deal with a world where the Chinas and the Indias, some of the Gulf states, Russia, Brazil, if we're going to deal with a world where those countries are at the top table with the United States, where the European Union in its wider form is up there as well, then we have to provide 
answers to a post-industrial world. Now, that means that jobs, because no congressman, no member of parliament in my country ever got elected by vote for me and I'll make you redundant. It just isn't the greatest election <laughs> slogan of all time. And yet, we still have, and I say this with great respect to your nation, we still have an impetus of saying, let's protect, let's stick up the tariff barriers, let's keep out all the stuff. Actually, by doing so, we condemn a generation to doing stuff we shouldn't be doing in an environment in which we shouldn't be doing it for a market that wants to pay less than we can afford. And politicians in, in Europe are doing it as well. This concept of saying, I've got to keep these people in work, therefore I'll keep out the change. I'll fight the innovation because it keeps them in a job. And true, genuine political courage will come about and drive forward an ability for, especially younger people, to be skilled onto the page of innovation and let those low jobs go. And then what you get is you actually drive a value-added economy, a knowledge-based economy, an innovation-based economy. The challenge is you will never, ever, ever actually deliver the volume of jobs in the same way. Because at every single step of innovation, the one thing you drive, drive out is the labor cost. And that always means fewer, but better skilled people. Sustainable, yes. Wealth creative, for sure. Deals with that challenge, definitely. But the problem is it doesn't employ as many people as it does in the old-fashioned way, whether it's textiles or automotive, whatever it is. That's the challenge in a democratic, capitalistic country. How all of this, which we all know is right, how do you actually deliver volume of sustainable employment? I welcome your views on that um, when we have our discussion. A couple of the ways forward which would help in all developed economies, but especially the European Union and the United States of America, we have got to drive better skills into young people. The adult illiteracy rate in Britain and America is exactly the same. It's 20%. One in five of the adults who are in the United States and in Britain cannot read to the standard of an 11-year-old. And the innumeracy rate is even worse. It's one in three. One in three of the adults in America, one in three of the adults in Britain, cannot add up two three-figure numbers. And my friends, we want, we, we want to do all this, do we? And we just, by implementing all of this, we will write off a substantial part of our society and can then condemn them to one of two things. Either no work, or work that only survives because it's protected by protectionism and isolationism. <coughs> which at the end of the day is self-defeating because the one thing you do by that is you stop China getting wealthier. And anybody who tells you it's in your interest or my interest for China to stay poor is mad. Because the quicker that farmer gets wealthy, the quicker he wants to buy a mobile phone, the software from which came out of your brains. The quicker he will buy a motor car, the computer in which will come out of your innovation. The quicker the developing world gets rich the better it will be to maintain a sustainable, innovative-based, knowledge-based economy in the developed world. That's a very difficult political message to sell. Because people don't vote in people who say, I want that opponent over there to get richer. But actually, over a century which belongs to Asia, it is the root, it's root one for national wealth. But the journey through it is hugely challenging. Because if we don't produce skilled people, we'll fail. And if we actually don't get on the page of free trade to make it happen, then again, we won't put the ball in the net. Perhaps I could just leave you with this last thought. If we make this work, no one aspect of society can put it off. You need to get a government of any party, of any colour, in either of our countries, on the page of building capacity. 2,000 years ago, somebody said, if I give people fish every day, I'll be giving them fish every day for the rest of their lives. If I actually build them a fishing boat and teach them how to fish, 
I never have to give them fish again. That is the secret of the implementation of an innovation agenda in a developed economy. Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> and the other mystery solved, um, when Lord Jones began, he actually talked about the government of all talents. Well, I knew that uh, in the day that uh, Lord Jones was called a GOAT, and I didn't realize why, but the GOAT was the acronym for the government of all talents, so uh, I think he takes that with pride being called a GOAT. I am a GOAT. Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, I am going to talk for two seconds. Um, it's very difficult to uh, follow Lord Jones, and first I want to just recognize Nick McKinnis who's right over there, Nick, raise your hand. He actually heads up the US, UK Trade and Investment Network. Uh, we also have Denise, uh, uh, Denise Harris and Melinda Goforth, who's actually the your title there, Denise. Denise heads up the Southeast region for UKTI at the British Embassy here in Washington, and Melinda heads up the team here in Washington. So what I'm gonna actually talk about now really relates to the work that UK Trade and Investment is doing with the innovation policy that Lord Jones and Rob have laid out for us. And I think it really is important to note that you know, Rob said it's important for governments to have defined strategies and innovation. And what Lord Jones talked about is the UK actually in 2004 defined this 10-year strategy. And it's really the, the map of what we're using to help actually take that policy and translate it into actual business action. So this 10-year strategy is talking about um, ways that we can actually, as a government and industry and academia, increase the percentage of um, R&D to GDP from 1.5 to 2.9, or 1.5 to 2.9%. What that translates into are billions and billions of pounds that are available for entrepreneurs, for businesses, for universities to actually do R&D and innovate in the UK. And as trade and investment folks here in the US, what we do is we take those innovation policies and use them as tools and products to work with a variety of organizations here. I think um, what Lord Jones mentioned in terms of John Denham's Innovation Nation white paper uh, is very interesting and if any of you uh, <coughs> are interested, you can look it up very easily. Don't confuse it with John Kao's Innovation Nation book. Um, I know that John Kao's book came first and I don't think that John Denham actually uh, stole the idea. Uh, but one of the things that John um, Kao said in his book is that government does actually need a strategy and it's imperative that we do. And, and Rob was alluding to that, that we haven't in the US had these strategies. In the UK, we've seen a lot of activity and Lord Jones actually gave the update. We've seen movement of our business R&D as a percentage because of the explicit government focus on innovation and innovation policy. And what does that mean? It means very tangible programs, as Lord Jones mentioned, the Office of Life Science, um, they've created an innovation path. So if you've got an innovative medical device or medicine, um, they're going to be piloting those drugs for six month periods of time. They've given a budget to it. You don't have to go through the very long bureaucratic process. They're actually infusing innovation into the healthcare system. That's just one example. Um, we've talked about skills in universities. The real linking up of business with universities and skills with these collaboration agreements and with other structures, we're seeing very great um, results from that with our business because a lot of our businesses, actually, the first step they're taking into the UK is through uh, a collaboration with a university. Or they may want a postdoc to actually conduct research on their behalf. The UK government provides funding and support for those sorts of initiatives. So I'm not going to go through it all, and I think Lord Jones did an excellent job, if I do say, um, in terms of really laying out the call to action. He took us on this journey, worldwide journey from China, uh, letting us know what the imperative was. The UK has actually um, responded to that call of action with the framework, with lots of programs at the government, at the academic and at the university level. And we're here on the ground. Um, you know, my colleagues here in Washington, and Nick is based in New York, his team of 120 folks across the US work not just with businesses, but with universities and other organizations to make sure that we're synced up and that we're looking at how collaboration uh, and innovation really foster foreign direct investment. And um, I think that it would 
you know, it would, if you're interested in it, you should talk to us afterwards about what are some of these programs, how can we actually further these relationships with what you're doing, with your organization, because they're, you know, it's a, it's a huge Chinese menu in terms of a particular funding scheme, a particular um, network you may tap into, um, there are universities that we can help you uh, associate with. So there's just a huge range of, of services and opportunities. And I think that the key is the UK has had the vision to set out this innovation policy, and now we're actually on the ground working to translate that into as what Lord Jones called making money. It's the wealth creation that we're really focused on, translating that innovation policy into tangible activity. So that's really what I wanted to highlight. Well, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob, for the chance to be here. And uh, may I say, Lord Jones, I, my first job out of college was with the British Leland Motors right. in London. <laughs> in the complaint for charity, then. In the complaint department. <laughs> so you're a very busy person. <laughs> this was my very first job. And I, you know, so I go and I show up in the complaint department, and there were masses of uh, file cabinets. And they were, this was before computers in offices, and so I was just typing letters and pulling out drawers that were filled with complaints. But no, you know, there must have been 10,000 complaints, and there were about three letters a day that went out. In <laughs> so I'm sure this was before the British motor industry uh, picked up the pace. <laughs> and um, I'd like to also comment on your. Um, experience going from the private sector to the public sector, because that's what I did when IBM uh, loaned me to the National Defense University for three years as a uh, visiting professor. And I think that experience of being on the fault line between the public sector and the private sector is really valuable because it exposes one to a different set of principles, a different set of, um, of uh, challenges, and it also gives one the opportunity to bring from your own experience the richness of your experience into a different setting. And in my case, I was surprised to find, going to your point about public procurement, the, the conception in government about the private sector and procurement. And there really was a white hat, black hat mentality that I really hadn't experienced, being, even though I've been in IBM more than 30 years. And um, so the the challenge was to to change that perception very broadly and to um, enrich the setting with some principles from the private sector and some observations about behavior, private sector behavior that I hope would help change that. Um, so with that in mind, with that background, let me talk for a few minutes, if I may, about um, and comment on your perspective in UK and US innovation. And first, let me say that um, I think your point about university and collaboration with business is a really critical one. And as I look at the challenges from a, in our society from a technology point of view, being that that's my background, I see some solutions that will arise only by a very robust university industry collaboration. So for instance, in the area of nanotechnology, and we all, I think, read about nanotechnology across a whole variety of, whether it's nanobiology or nanomedicine or nano, just plain old nano um, informatics. Nanotechnology is a solution to a whole lot of societal problems. Today in the United States, my observation and that of the IT industry is that we are in the United States ahead in nanotechnology research, and it's our our area to lose at this moment in time. But it's only going to take a very robust, a continuing a very robust relationship between government, industry, and universities to move this ball forward. And I would really encourage us to do that. Another area of in the similar vein is around um, high-end computing. And um, there are two, I think, really important um, inflection points right now. One is around what we would call hybrid computing and taking the leap forward, a similar leap forward to that which was made 30 years ago in computing, 
with the introduction of the IBM 360 or 370, that kind of an opportunity is available to us today if we uh, make the right kinds of investments and put together a roadmap, a plan, a strategic plan to lead in the computing area. And it will only happen if we have this robust collaboration between industry, universities, and government. And let me also talk about, to your point of uh, government procurement, IBM is about a $100 billion company. We do uh, about maybe five or six billion dollars of government business, so it's not a big part of our business, but it's a really, really critical part of the business. And the reason is because government, as you mentioned, I believe, it is, is that absolutely right, goes, government provides scale, scope, leadership, it's a catalyst to bring together partners who wouldn't come together otherwise. It merges, the, it enables the merging of skills around um, project management and then, which is a very broad, complex skill, but very important for the complicated, complex projects, large-scale mission-oriented projects that government often funds. And it also, those kinds of partnerships enable smaller firms with deep technical skills to bring those skills into a, an environment where we can actually make the complex systems that are driving our society today. As you think about government procurement in that vein, how government approaches it in terms of how it uh, is flexible or inflexible, how it values um, life cycle costing as opposed to value costing as opposed to just the product, the individual product item that they're purchasing today, and how it approaches this complex issue of um, skill development in government so that the skills of the government procurement folks are as acute as the skills in the private sector. These are all areas that I think we, we in capitalistic dem democracies need to work on if we're going to continue to address and lead. And to your point around um, the growth in China and India, I had the the great um, luxury opportunity of taking my class at the Industrial College of the Armed Forces to China for a two-week trip over the last several years, three, three trips. We went to Shanghai and Beijing and specifically focused on um, IT industry, uh, the electronics industry. The growth was incredible. It was very substantial and the Chinese have a very complex and sophisticated approach to what they call <coughs> indigenous innovation. And so they are taking technologies and putting them together in unique uh, configurations that enable them to innovate very well. So for instance, today, if you look at high performance computing, in the top, I think it's 20 systems, there are two indigenous, innovation, indigenous innovations basic in high performance computing from China. If you look back uh, five years, there would be no systems from China at the top end of high-end computing. And so um, this is a really important and critical technology for leadership and to continue to build the skills that we need if we're going to succeed. And um, so I think, again, this goes to the point again of government, industry, university collaboration. And let me just close with one idea that I hope um, can sort of bring it all together. As we, uh, in our industry, which is a global industry, we're very active in the UK and elsewhere around the world, as we look at how we are going to encourage growth development so that we all have a better society, this whole concept of funding transformational uh, investments has to change its mantra a little bit in our view, and that is, if you're going to have a transformational investment, you can't have an incremental funding plan. Incremental funding doesn't bring transformation. There have to be some big bets placed. And um, this perhaps goes to the concept of driving innovation forward so that we all benefit and compete. And by big bets, I mean, you know, if you look at the stimulus funding, there were lots and lots and lots and lots of two and three million dollar projects. And this because of the jobs issue. So I, I don't have the solution, but I have a real question is how can we thoughtfully approach the need for transformation across society, innovative, technology driven transformation 
and be willing to put the big bets forward to really drive it as opposed to incrementally grow, because I don't think that will bring the solution forward. So with that, I'll close and thank you again for the opportunity. Questions, but let me just say one sort of maybe response to comment Board Jones made. Uh, I think I agree with you 100%. Well, actually 98%. <laughs> we'll talk about 2%. And I think we actually, <coughs> Taffy talked about China taking technologies and moving to new things. I would actually argue that taking technologies is actually the right way to describe China. Uh, that I don't have. A, I want China to get rich. I want them to get rich as fast as possible. But I want them to get rich by focusing on raising productivity growth and innovating in the fair way, not by, for example, taking multiple IT standards that are global in nature, every country in the world agreed on them, tweaking that standard so that only Chinese companies can sell in the Chinese marketplace, which is what they're doing. Most, most recently, or most prominently, with WAPI, although they sort of formally backed off on WAPI, but they're still continuing to manipulate that standard. Uh, IP theft, you look at a company like Huawei, which frankly wouldn't be even be in business today if they hadn't stolen the Cisco IP. They actually replicated errors in the Cisco operating system into their own system, uh, not because they thought this is a great error, uh, <laughs> they stole it. Uh, the Ch Chinese government itself is using pirated copies of Windows and uh, uh, Microsoft Windows, the Chinese government. Uh, forced tech transfer, company after company being told that if you want market access to China, you have to produce here. So I agree with you on China and Indian Oil, but what I think we can agree with, although I was over in 10 Downing about a month and a half ago, and I got a violent reaction against what I just said here, saying that I was somehow a, um, an imperialist protectionist. Um, I don't think you're imperialist. <laughs> I said well, yeah, you guys were the imperialists. We were uh, we were never imperialists, but uh, so uh, that's just well, you were, but you weren't very good at it. The sun did set on our empire. <laughs> so I don't know if you have a reaction to that. I I, I actually think the uh, your comments about China and and uh, counterfeiting and IT and IP are absolutely spot on. I I. I I mean, we could we could spend the next hour giving examples, and, uh, and uh, there was a there's a lovely one about the, uh, the fastest railway in the world from Shanghai Airport downtown to um, uh, into the heart of Shanghai. And Siemens um, built it, and uh, this isn't a British or American issue; it's a German issue. And um, they were a bit surprised when they found that the next one that was being built in some other city in China was exactly the same as the one was done in Shanghai. And um, my, uh, I think I have two conclusions from it. If you can't beat them, join them. I think I, I, I wonder whether your very proper sentiment um, is capable of being sorted. I, I, you see, the greatest theft of IP in China is by Chinese against Chinese. I mean, they, they, they do it to themselves. And I do worry as to whether we can do anything about it, so therefore should we work with it as opposed to against it? because the downside of working against it becomes very nasty very quickly. I throw that out and I'd welcome an answer because I, I acknowledge you're right in what you're saying. The other, um, the other part of it is the quickest way to get IP protection working around the world globally is to get the Chinese to start inventing things themselves. Because the moment they do, they'll have something to protect. <coughs> and then you'll find that they'll be the greatest force for, for, for implementation of IP protection you've ever seen, because they won't want it. That. So, so there's, a, there's an argument in trying to get them and encourage them to do it themselves. I think the other um, aspect of it is, even if I'm wrong in saying we ought to work with it rather than fight it, I think you and I are agreed that it's in our interest to get them off it. Absolutely. I mean, a poor China does not contribute to nothing, actually. Only, only downtime. Um, it's a, a, to be fair to them, for just a little minute, the Americans did do it to the Europeans in the late 19th century. You stole everything. Yep. <laughs> 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 and, the, and the Japanese did it to the Americans after the Second World War. They the stole, only difference they stole everything. I mean, no, but the only difference, no, to be fair, the only well, difference is size. No, no, no. no. Oh, and the no, other no. difference is they're joking to you. No. <laughs> the difference was when uh, when Samuel Slater stole the Arkwright plans on threat of death, 
came to the U.S., went to New York, got funding by Moses Brown, built the first textile mill using British plans. I don't think we were in the WTO. <laughs> <laughs> That's the difference. Yeah. The Chinese said, we want all the advantages of the WTO without the downside. Without the downside. That, look, the French have done that for 100 years. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I don't want to dominate this. Uh, so uh, let's uh, go here, and if you can, Brian, if you want to just identify yourself first, please. Uh, Brian Payne, CCIA, University of Michigan. Uh, First, just one quick comment on the Chinese. They had 800,000 patent filings in the Chinese Patent Office this last year. So I want to throw that out as a prospect of the opposite kind, actually creating a patent thicket that will be largely impenetrable to the rest of the world. And with that comment. The main point I want, would like to hear addressed is, uh, in, and I, I think there was sort of a mismatch on this talk of the government role in procurement, because we don't see the government here as a lead innovator, except possibly in terms of scale and scope and so on. In Europe, there is much more of a sense that procurement can drive innovation. So there's a lot of talk about user-driven innovation. Europe has a lead market initiative. And I was curious as to what your thoughts in the UK were on that even more aggressive European vision. Let me, um, let me take three countries in Europe and partly um, use that as an example, partly to say, yes, you're right, and partly to say, I wonder. <coughs> First one is, let's go to France. They are probably the best in the developed world at using government as a, a government procurement, as a tool for increased productivity and innovation enhancement in the private sector. They do it brilliantly. They do it by this amazing gray area between the public and private sector. You, you know, we, we, we and you are very, um, you, you mentioned that, you know, there's this very big line. I can't remember the description you gave, you called it something. This line. Well, yeah, but there's this line, there is, between the private and public sector. A lot of it to do with so there are no conflicts of interest, a lot of it to do with property, a lot of it to do with where do the tax dollars go and bribery and corruption, all of that. And it's brought about this enormous um, distinction between the two. <coughs> In France, and I'm not going down the value, value judgment of corruption and all that stuff, but in France, there is a real grey area between the public and private sectors. And people move from one to the other seamlessly. And Sarkozy or Chirac would have found nothing wrong in having a company using loads of euros from the French taxpayer to steal an edge on another company in the European Union. And I've gone into this in huge detail with them. They see nothing wrong in it. It's not that they actually think they're cheating. They actually believe that is the role of government. What you end up with is some of the most productive manufacturing processes on Earth. The most productive country on Earth per dollar, euro, pound, yen invested, per money invested is America. Fabulous use of technology. The most productive country on earth per hour worked is France. And they, and they do it by this enormous drive of government procurement, government involvement, government capacity building in the private sector. Move to Germany for a minute and look at one sector, pharmaceutical. There isn't a pharmaceutical industry in Germany anymore. I mean, there isn't. And why? Because government regulated them out of it. If you talk to Pfizer, Eli Lilly, Johnson & Johnson from your country, if you talk to AstraZeneca or GlaxoSmithKline from mine, they don't do it in Germany anymore. And for the country that is the greatest exporter on earth, in absolute terms, more than you and more than China, more than anybody, which is Germany, I mean, they, they are fabulous innovative exporters of manufacturing goods value-added innovative goods that lose their pharmaceutical sector through government interference in the regulatory regime is a, is a, it's a crime. And they haven't got them. And it's because government said, right, we're going to steer this. We know where we want this to go. We're going to use regulation and law to steer it that, steer it that way. And the market refused to go because they've got choice. They could come to my country or your country. And, of course, the other thing they've got, which is the other counterfeiting point, which is the greatest counterfeit of pharmaceutical products is India. I mean, in Mumbai, around Mumbai, the counterfeiting is going on in pharmaceuticals. 
And one of my worries about counterfeiting is Airbus have started building in, uh, in um, Xi'an, and so have Boeing. And you only need a counterfeit bit of a plane to not do the job and kill a few people. You only need a counterfeited drug out of Mumbai to do exactly what you shouldn't do and kill some people. And this is going to become an issue which will become a war. I don't mean military war, but will become an economic war. And that's going to be just manna from heaven to protectionism, which is the last thing in the world we need. The third point, the third example of government collaboration is ours. Now, we have the most open, to our own detriment, government procurement process on Earth. I mean, I'm always, I'm, a, I'm an inveterate free trader, and yet when I see the way that our government will buy from other countries because they play the game, and then you find your country, <coughs> and then you find that other countries don't play the game. I hate to say, but your country is not exactly high up on the, on the plus point on this one. You know, we will buy military hardware from other countries. You still say you won't, even when we, you, we're your best friend. Even when our soldiers and your soldiers go in harm's way more than any other country on earth. And we are, you know, without you, Europe would be speaking German. Without us, there wouldn't have been a Europe for you to even come and say. It's <laughs> true. We are, so we are arm in arm in democracy here. And the way that you behave as a procurement process on military hardware from us is, is dreadful. Whereas we say we want our soldiers to have the best. And if that happens to be American or Israeli, if that happens to be German or French, we don't mind, we want to have the best. Now, what we've done by that, of course, is that we've delivered more value for the taxpayer. Because the taxpayer gets more and better for the money than an American taxpayer gets or a French taxpayer gets. So we're quite good at that. Where we're not where we where we have this seared in our consciousness fear is that because you know, you know what you're you know what you're doing with General Motors? We we have two words to describe what we're doing with General Motors. It's called British Labour. I mean, it took us 30 years. In 1975, Harold Wilson's government poured billions into saving British Labour, nationalising it, putting it into your recruitment, our group to chapter them. And 30 years later, after it had drunk so much of the well of government subsidy, um, Blair actually let the remnants of it called MG Rover go, bust and finish in the middle of a general election campaign. Because the public consciousness had got to the point where they realised making cars is what Toyota does in our country extremely well. And it's what MG Rover didn't do anymore. That took 30 years and an absolute fortune for public consciousness to match economic reality. You're at the beginning of that path, by the way, and I, I use General Motors, I don't say this with any prejudice about them, damn good company, good people who work there. This isn't a name issue, this is a concept issue. Now, because of that, we have a problem when government says, I'm going to pick winners. Remember in my remarks I said about how we put up this fund for innovation, and part of it is, right, which ones do we invest in? And it doesn't sit well with the British psyche, because our track record of picking winners has been lousy, and, we, and therefore we don't do it. The price we pay for that is I can show you some damn good companies that don't get government help in the procurement process in a way that rightly you would help yours, rightly, I think that's a good thing. And we don't do it because we're terrified of what we all call the British Labour and example. Are there, um, yes, sir. Uh, Andrew Brookers from Harvey Nash. We're um, global technology uh, recruiters and consultants. And I was quite pleased to hear a number of people on the panel talking about the, the, the talent pipeline, about the people who have to get encouraged people to, to study within technology and encourage that. I just wanted to kind of tell us how they're going to Um, the 19th century, where did enterprise flourish? It clustered around transport. <coughs> so wherever you got your, the ability to get your goods to market or get your effluent out. So that was a port, it was a river, 
in my hometown it's canals, and eventually across the Western world it was the railway. So wherever you've got uh, the ability to have transport, you found enterprise flourishing. In the 20th century that changed, it became the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer came to town, built the car plant, built the steel plant, sunk the pit, uh, built the textile mill, built the shipyards, whatever it may be, and ran a big, huge employer of unskilled people, grew enterprise and wealth creation and the use of knowledge. In the 21st century, where China wants your lunch and India wants your dinner, the only place you're going to see enterprise flourish is where it grows and develops around the development, transfer and exploitation of knowledge. Knowledge, at all in all its forms, is the only place where you're going to be able to create wealth in a developed economy in the 21st century. And in one way the problem is, it's all talked about in what we talked about today. And, and, that, and that's right in so many ways, because it has to be the standard bearer. The top end of this has to be the standard bearer. But if, if you go to, I mean, I, I've, I've been to 48 of the 50 states. Very few Americans have been to 48 of the 50 states, and I've been to 40, I haven't been to Hawaii, and I haven't been to South Dakota for some reason. <laughs> I don't know what that ever did to me, but I've never been. So I'm not saying this from you know, what I read or ignorance. I've experienced this on the ground as a corporate lawyer doing m and across borders. I've seen this on the ground. It is easier to protect an unskilled person in their job politically than it is to have the courage to make them redundant, skill them up what government expects, and put them into a value-added job. It is just an easier thing to do to put up the tariff barriers and condemn them to a life of unskilled work. The problem you've got is a zero-sum game. But the problem we've got in what we do is it's quite rarefied. It doesn't resonate. What we're talking about does not resonate down in Main Street, USA, or the back streets of Birmingham in England. You know, they would see this, they're wrong, by the way, utterly wrong, but they see it as elitist. A politician would tell you he doesn't get votes from this. They would see it as something that just gobbles up tax money, <coughs> employs a few people. We all know why it's absolutely Route 1 to wealth generation in the 21st century. But how you get that to get a kid of 16, 17 coming out of school in Germany or France, in Australia or Canada or Japan, in America or Britain, how you get them to understand if they don't get their ticket, if they don't learn how to be a carpenter or an electrician, if they don't understand how to be a mechanic or a technician in allowance, a software, a software um, uh, engineer. What, if we don't get this idea that they need their ticket, which is then transportable, they could go and do that job in India, then frankly, go and do it in Brazil or South Africa, go anywhere with it. But if we don't get that culture into the schools of our countries, you can forget all this, because your premise is spot on. But if you don't get the young to do it, then frankly, this will be driven. And this will create wealth, but it won't employ people. It will not employ huge waves <coughs> of people as they move away from protected industries. And it's not an American issue. I mean, Germany protect people staggeringly. And, you know, Germany is a great, quite a mystery, really, because they are this fabulous innovator of manufacturing processes. They are this huge exporter. They protect thousands, hundreds of thousands of unskilled people. So it's not just an American issue. But how do you get the young to understand that schools and wealth creation are intrinsically linked. Um, it's a principal process. Maybe I'll add a couple of thoughts to that. Um, I, I agree with, you, with all that you said, Martin, but I'd like to augment the following way. From a company's point of view, where you invest today in the global economy is really dependent on two things, I think. One is infrastructure that exists in a society, and the other is skills because you can go wherever the, wherever the skills reside and there's a fundamental infrastructure and you can place um, your investments there. And companies aren't doing so much. I mean, you know, building the factories, as you mentioned, and that was 30 years ago. Today, <coughs> you go to a location, have a few highly skilled workers, and you can reach the global economy from wherever you happen to be. So skills become a differentiator. And then the question becomes, how do you um, how do you do two things? I think one is get the young kids to understand this whole important thing about getting their ticket punched, or what are the skills that they're going to need to collaborate and to, ex to experience 
high quality of life in their lifetimes. And the other thing is there's a big role for non-traditional academic, non-traditional educational institutions to get going. You know, for instance, companies do this in a big way. In my own company, for example, we've developed a whole curriculum what we, around what we call services science management engineering. And it's basically a curriculum that's between as a graduate and undergraduate curriculum that sort of bridges across engineering, business management, and um, communication skills. Because as we look at the kinds of people that are going to contribute effectively in a global company, in a company like IBM, we do business in 170 countries around the world, you need to have people with deep analytical skills, deep industry skills, and really highly capable communication skills. Because when you're dealing with complex systems, you have so many people from different um, backgrounds coming into the solution mix that if you can't communicate well and be a good leader, then you're not going to be able to put together these complex solutions. So I think the challenge is recognizing the problem, putting something together for the young kids to get them going in these directions, and then taking an active step in moving the skill bar forward. I agree. Uh, can I just quickly? I, I actually just want to, we, I want to, we have one more question before we go. So. One last question for everybody, and then uh, we'll go here, and that would be a quick question, and then maybe quick. Quick question, Ken Jarvo, Athena Alliance. Um, last month, Nesta put out an, another uh, innovation index. One of the studies as part of that was a follow-up to an earlier study on hidden innovation, which is the areas that are not traditionally high R&D intensive. Uh, it seems like the UK is a leader in looking at those non-traditional innovation areas. Can you talk a little bit about the policies in those areas? The, the uh, most difficult thing in government, not necessarily politicians, but in government, and that's at a regional level or in your country, a state level, right the way up to Fed or national, is getting, getting meaningful data from the hidden areas of your economy on which you predicate your decision making process. And, and I go, I, I go the length of all my advisory work, I, I, I'm on the advisory board of <coughs> 10 companies probably, and all over Britain, and I, I go to different sized businesses in different parts of Britain all the time. And you would be amazed <coughs> at how someone is being innovative and just doesn't even realize they are being innovative. So if you sent them a questionnaire, and say, do you give us some examples of an innovative process in your business? They, they'd say, we don't have to. Um, a classic one, a real classic one was, um, they, they, uh, the Olympic Games is happening in London in 2012. You're all very welcome to my country. Is that picking winners? That's picking winners big time. <laughs> and uh, actually, I'm really chuffed because the US team uh, is, not only big, but hugely successful. And it's going to base its camp for four weeks beforehand in Birmingham, in my hometown. So the, uh, the, the contribution to the local economy, that would be enormous, so thank you for that. I'm serious, that's, that's excellent. Um, uh, the the um, uh, people who provide the, 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 the um, we would call it aggregate, yeah, the, the, the sand and gravel and the cement and the concrete and all that stuff, for, I mean, for what is the most enormous infrastructure project, huge infrastructure project. Um, it's by the river down in the Thames, down by Greenwich. And this stuff, the stuff they need, is in the middle of England, and there's a motorway between the two. And they say, we won't do that. We'll put it on a train. We'll take it down to a beachhead there on the Thames, about 15 miles away, and we'll boat it down to the site. And they delivered this fabulous piece of work that said the pollution that would be avoided by train and boat rather than truck and the congestion on the motorway and the danger and all that stuff. And they got the contract. And they got the contract for the whole thing. I think it industry is they're called. And they got a fabulous contract to win, but they got it right. The government sent out this wonderful form about hidden innovation, you see. And I saw it. And they tick the box. We dig, we dig sand and gravel. We know innovative. And they actually tick the box to say they had no innovative processes in their company. Because what they did was they were quarry boys. They went down in, stuck a piece of dynamite, dug it out, crushed it up, stuck it on a truck, and out it went. And they, they thought themselves, well, we're not innovative. Actually, the process 
of taking it down by train and boat rather than truck was supremely innovative. I mean, it was exactly what a nation like yours and mine need. And they thought they were not an innovative company. That's a problem. big problem. How, and how does a guy, a civil servant, sitting in Washington or London formulate policy and advise a government when the raw material you need it effectively isn't there? No, it's a big, big challenge. Uh, which we are trying to get our hands around, as you are, in many other countries. So um, I think we could do this for at least another three hours. <laughs> we haven't even got on to isolation. Yeah, so I think there's food out there. Just, you know. But unfortunately, we're not able to do that as much as we would enjoy it. So uh, please join me in thanking the three great panelists.